we will be discussing the Giants and the 49 the Patriots and the Jets game, college football and fantasy football. The Giants got beat down by the 49ers. Yeah, it was a pretty bad game, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. But there was one player who showed the most struggles, and that was Daniel Jones. Yeah, Daniel Jones has been having a really rough time lately. I feel for him. 200 yards, no touchdowns, and a pick. I mean, when you don't have a really great O-line either, it's really rough. So you can't put all the blame on him. Defense wasn't great either. Gave up over 400 yards. I'm not going to lie, the Giants are pretty deep down this year. 49ers offense and defense thrived, and they only gave up 150 yards. Yeah, the Niners are looking pretty solid this year. I don't know about the Giants. Brock Purdy showed some uh, signs of light, throwing 310 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, he had some uh, good moments throughout the game, I'll say. One of those was to Debo Samuel, who threw, who uh, also had 129 receiving yards. Yeah, Debo, he's a really good player. He's a different animal. And uh, I think Debo is definitely their wide receiver one. You know, Brandon Ayuk is great, but I think Debo definitely is on another level. Debo is just, he's a complete animal. He's a great player all around, very fast, great movement. Obviously, they have some great defensive pieces, so they should probably win that division. No doubt. I feel like they yep. can go very far with their division. I don't think anyone's beating the 49ers until at least the uh, conference championship. So, Yeah, I can agree with that. The 49ers are a very solid team this year. They got a lot of great players all around. This concludes our coverage of the Giants and 49ers game. We will return with Jesse. We'll be talking about the Jets and the Patriots. Welcome back to Left Bench Sports. I'm Jesse Link, and here we're going to be talking about the Patriots and the Jets game that occurred last week. So I don't even really know where to start with this, but I guess if we have to start one place, we're going to start with Zach Wilson. I mean, Wilson was atrocious in the last game. He's obviously not capable of uh, playing at this level. I mean, that game was quite literally a competition of which quarterback was worse, and somehow Zach Wilson managed to win that one. Um, and, you know, him and Robert Sala are like – Two angels made in heaven. I mean, together they are perfect for each other. Zach Wilson has the ego of an elephant, and Robert Sala just constantly lies to the fan base about it. I mean, he's giving them hope for an inevitably 3-15 season here with a with zero shot at a playoff win. Um, I don't even understand how Zach Wilson made it to this league in the first place, but that's another story. Uh, and then, I mean, to all those delusional Jet fans out there... Or, we're just going to have to say Aaron Rodgers is not coming back. And I don't know who thinks that he is and why he thinks he is, but he's got a torn Achilles, and you don't come back from that in a single season. And I don't know who believes that you can come back from in a season. Even Aaron Rodgers, I mean, as good of a quarterback as he is and as much hustle he has, he's not coming back from it. It's just not possible. Um, and that leads me to the Jets QB situation. I mean, if they're stuck with Zach Wilson for the rest of the season – this is their season. That's all they've got. I mean, it's just going to continue on like this for the rest of the season, and they're going to have to punt it away until next year. But, you know, if, if the Jets front office has half a brain and can figure out how to make this work and sign maybe another QB or a second string or somebody who's not Zach Wilson, then maybe the Jets have a shot at possibly a playoff run or a wild card spot, but who knows? I mean... No front office is really smart anymore in any sport. I mean, just look at the Yankees and the Jets for an example there. Um, and that that's about it for all I can say for the Jets here is that they need Zach Wilson out. And if they, if they don't get him out, then this is their season. And that's all they got for the rest of the couple months that they've got in the NFL. And uh, all right, so that's about all I have to say. That's my rant. So next up is Smitty and Jake on college football. All this after the break. Hello and welcome back to Left Bench Sports. Thank you, Jesse, for that rant on the Jets situation. And now we'll be covering college football from this past weekend. All right, so first off, we have the Oregon versus Colorado game where Oregon just absolutely demolished and outplayed Colorado in every single way. Uh, going into this game, Oregon was ranked 10th and Colorado was 19. Obviously a lot of hype with Coach Prime and everything, but just a really tough matchup uh, against Oregon. Smitty, what do you? What was your initial prediction for this game? Uh, my initial prediction was I. I always thought that Oregon was gonna win, but like, just 
with the last two games that Colorado has played, they played really well against um, their last two games. But after the fact like that Oregon's just a better ranked team, they are much better like overall. They've played better teams than Colorado. So I thought I always thought that Oregon was going to win, but obviously they and they did win. They won 41 to 6, which was yeah. a bad bad score and they just got outplayed the whole entire game. Yeah, you know, I thought Oregon was definitely going to win. Uh I didn't think it was going to be that much, but it definitely shocked me a little. Oregon's definitely like Way better defense, stronger on defense, stronger on offense. I think Colorado just needs like a year or two, and they'll be a much better team because Coach Prime just got there. He's going to make some big transformations. But, yeah, in the first half, Oregon shut out Colorado 35-0. They just couldn't get anything going for them the whole game. Uh, nothing came from the run game. Their leading rusher was Anthony Hanker with 31 yards, and Shador Sanders didn't even throw a touchdown until the last few minutes. Smitty, what do you think Colorado's biggest problem is as a team? Um, I think Colorado's biggest problem is that they're young. A lot of kids on a lot of kids on the team have not played big college footballs football like how like Oregon has. Like they're not on a big stage yet. Like Shador and Travis Hunter, he didn't play in the game, but they're coming from Jackson State and they were playing on a little like not as big as a, a stage as they would be playing in like how they played against Oregon. Yeah, I think Travis Hunter definitely would have helped. I mean, obviously they wouldn't have won, but he definitely makes a big difference. I think their biggest problem is the O-line and defense. I mean, you saw their defense was getting ran through, and their O-line isn't strong enough. as uh, They're just letting pressure get to the quarterback every time, and as they keep going three and out, they're just going to put pressure on the defense, and they're just going to be winded after every drive. Mm -hmm. All right, so obviously Oregon dominated on both sides of the ball. Uh, they moved up to 4-0, and and they're now ranked ninth, while also pushing Colorado out of the top 25. Moving to the next game, we had number five, Florida State, matched up against Clemson. This game was a little bit closer than the last one, as Florida State won 31-24 to in overtime. Smitty, do you think Florida State is a valid contender for the college football championship? Um, I think they are a very, very good team to play in the college championship with – their QB, first off, their de their defense, their O line, and also their wide receivers. Like their wide receivers and their QB just match up every game. He j they just they throw deep balls, they throw short balls. Like they they're getting the scores that they need to. Like they just it was a good game against Clemson, but Florida State they're just a better team overall. Yeah, Florida State definitely a contender in my book for the championship. Uh, Clemson did lead the game in rushing with 146 total yards. Florida State only had 22, but passing game was even, both over 280 yards. But uh, Clemson started off pretty strong with the lead until halftime. It was 17-14. Near the end of the third quarter, Clemson led 24-17. But what do you think the big turnaround was going into the fourth quarter that allowed Florida State to get this game into overtime and win it? Um, I think the big turnaround in this game was that Florida State is just the stronger team. So they came out out of the like out of their out of the third quarter, fourth quarter, and they're just they came out stronger. They're a stronger team. Clemson, they haven't the last few years they haven't been as good as they used to be. Like how like they used to be at the top of the rank, and now they're not now they're not there. So Florida State just was the better team coming out of the fourth quarter. Yeah, better team. I think. A little bit better defense, stronger, as uh, that forced fumble at the end of the third quarter to tie it up, definitely a big difference. And then, of course, Keon Coleman, 24-yard touchdown in overtime. I mean, he's amazing. I think he could definitely be a high draft pick in the NFL draft coming. All right, now moving on to the uh, last game. This was a very, very good game between Notre Dame and Ohio State. I mean, this was a great game, and that last drive was crazy. Not too much scoring throughout the whole game as Ohio State went into halftime with a 10-0 lead, but Notre Dame was able to keep it close with their defense and get two touchdowns in the second half. Uh, one was a pass from San Hartman to Rico Flores, and Gabran Payne also crashed in for a score as well. So, I, mean, I personally thought Notre Dame at first, I thought they were going to be able to pull this game out, but who did you have winning going into the game? 
Um, going into the game, I thought Notre Dame was going to be the better team um, going in because their their QB is very good. Their coaching staff is very good, but like they just they felt like stronger coming out of last week's game. They felt like sh- felt stronger, better. But Ohio State, they came out, they won, they were the stronger team in the end. But like there was also in the last play, like there was only for Notre Dame, there was only ten guys on the field. Yeah. I was about to bring that up. Uh, I know their coach talked about it. He said it was it was too late. They didn't have time to go get an extra player in, but it happens. I think Ohio State, I think maybe Notre Dame's ego maybe got to them a little at the end. Like a very good drive from Kyle McCord with, within two minutes. It was crazy. Started off with two incomplete passes, third and ten. I thought for sure Ohio State was going to be done for, but – Kyle McCord and Buckeyes did not give up. He threw a pass to the one yard line, and with just three seconds left, they ran the ball in. So I couldn't believe it, and that uh, the energy from Ohio State was crazy after the game. But yeah, the fact that Notre Dame didn't have eleven players in that could have been a problem. I don't know if they would have been able to prevent the touchdown, but. Definitely a factor. Yeah, maybe even if they did have eleven players on the field, they could have had maybe even a pass rusher, like yeah. rusher, um, rushing the QB. Like if like, cause yeah, maybe like if there was eleven players on the field, they they could have gotten a chance to either intercept it, knock down the pass, or even sack the QB. But they they didn't have their eleven players, and they weren't ready for the play. Yep. All right. I think that was definitely the game of the week, but. That's all we got this week for college football and left bench sports. Uh, Don't go anywhere because Luke and Miles will hop on the set to talk about fantasy football. Hello and welcome back to Left Bench Sports. I'm your host, Miles Berkowitz, and this is Luke Jacklin. Now we'll be talking about some of our favorite waiver wire pickups for the upcoming fantasy week. It was a good week three around the NFL. Now let's talk about the fantasy football invocations of the week and who we want to pick up on the waiver wire. Well, first, I'd like to start off with Devon A. Chain of Miami Dolphins. He scored a whopping 52 fantasy points in Miami's route of Broncos country. He had 18 touches for 203 yards and two touchdowns, and he had four receptions for 30 yards. Well, although he only had 41 snap share uh, percentage, but he is very explosive. He's fast. Uh, the workload for him is set to increase as the season goes on. Hopefully, as Mike McDaniel sees uh, the progression in the offense and he loves the fast guys on his team. He's got Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, and now he has a chain. Yeah, as you were saying, I mean, he could still grow. I mean, he only played forty percent of the snaps, mm-hmm. so there's still room to grow. Yeah, there and now, Mostert. Most yeah, and Mostert, Mostert. They have a bunch of guys that are really fast. Yep. Yeah. Now let's talk about another rookie that we could pick up this week. Quentin Johnson. He's coming in for Mike Williams, who season-ending ACL injury. Um. But Quinn Johnson could step in very well. I mean, mm-hmm. the Chargers drafted him with a first-round pick. He hasn't done much so far, but you could see him get a lot better at Justin Herbert, and now he'll be playing a lot more. Yeah, I mean, they spent a first-round pick on him. It's not like they're not going to use him. Um, I think he's going to be very good at a TCU, and I really like him. Well, continuing the theme of rookies, let's talk about Texans quarterback C.J. Stroud. I mean, I really like him. Um he went to Ohio State. I know Ohio State quarterbacks, they don't get the best reputation coming out of the draft, but um, he's been a top f- 14 fantasy quarterback in the last two weeks. Um, he was 20 of 30 for 280 yards and two touchdowns, uh, 20 fantasy points. That's pretty good. And another thing that I really like about him, the Texans, uh, bad defense, so they're going to be playing from behind. The Titans, bad passing defense, going to be playing from behind. Jaguars, again, bad passing defense. So he has a weak division. Um, he already has a connection I can see with Tank Dell uh, and Nico Collins, so I really like that from him, and uh, I think it's going to be a really good season going forward for C.J. Stroud. Yeah, they have a lot of those guys, young guys like Tank Dell, Nico Collins, mm-hmm. a lot of young receivers to go with the young quarterback. Yeah. C.J. Stroud, you see a lot of room for him to grow, especially against a weak division. Yeah, he he could be really good for them. Yeah, he hasn't he hasn't really shown rushing upside yet, but hopefully we'll see that as the season progresses. That's all we have for you today on Left Bench Sports. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.